Hey everyone, back again. Now let's continue on with part two of the series I'm doing here, which is going to pick up from chapter three, The Jews and Society. Now before jumping into it, go check out part one if you haven't already. Uh, follow me on Instagram if you want to, at theory underscore and underscore philosophy, or on Twitter at David Guigno. Hi, if you're new here, it'd be a weird place for you to start, but I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. You'll see videos I release every single week. And uh, if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form where, you know, you can download it and go and listen to it wherever you want. Um, if you want to help me out, do all those things, like, share, subscribe. If you do listen to this on, you know, on a podcast platform that lets you leave reviews or stars, please do that. It would help me out a lot. You can help me out via, mon via monetarily. Uh, you can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, and there are links in the description, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, let us continue on here with part two, uh, the Jews and society. This is chapter three, the Jews and society. So at the time now, we just left off around the early 20th century, there was political anti-Semitism that viewed Jews and Jewish, well, Jewish people as a separate group and social anti-Semitism that responded to the entrance of Jewish people to previously foreclosed areas. So on the one hand, we had Jewish people that were viewed by politicians and by other you know, political parties as being a separate group that needed to be kept separate from everyone else. But then you had perhaps a more everyday kind of anti-Semitism that was responding to uh, Jewish people now occupying everyday roles and being among everybody else. And this made people feel anxious who weren't Jewish because of all the narratives they'd been told probably their whole lives and their parents' lives and their grandparents' lives about how Jewish people are bad or how they are going to uh, harm them in some way or other. Now, part of this was born out of this new idea of equality because the new idea of equality that came up through the Declaration of the Rights of Man or like in the Declaration of Independence, equality was always poorly sketched because it was really only reserved for white dudes in all of these settings. And so it reveals the extent to which that this idea was limited. There were, you know, to quote George Orwell, some people are more, or to paraphrase George Orwell, some everyone is equal but some people are more equal than others or how he says it you know i think it's all pigs are equal except or animals anyways all animals are equal except more animals are equal than others and that point i think really resonates here in that everyone was believing in this thing called equality but it was equality for only some while others would have to just sit by the wayside and just try to live without being properly represented by the state without having these protections of equality. So the people who would get to enjoy the privileges of equality were those that who most likely fit the mold of white European culture. And it, it would be different from nation to nation, of course, but if you largely fit into that, um, that paradigm, you know, being a Christian, being white, probably being a man, you'd be okay. So Jewish people who were beginning to enter all of these new places that were historically uh, foreclosed to them, had to then start to adopt these kinds of habits and ideas, very much at times at the expense of their own Jewish culture. They had to put that aside and put on this new face in order to move through the world without being discriminated against, without being uh, targeted. But at the same time, everyday people still wanted Jewish people to be marked in some way or other. So they did actually didn't really like it if Jewish people would just try to blend in with everyone else, because that would also contribute to those conspiracy theories that Jewish people secretly pulled the strings all the while remaining under the radar without having an outward face through political representation or anything else that could be easily pointed to. So they, everyday people that is, and politicians, wanted at the same time Jewish people to just adopt the Christian way of life, but at the same time 
wanted them to maintain their markers of difference so that they could be easily recognized, so that they could be easily easily uh, acknowledged as being different. So, like, and and it's so complicated, and different nations had different responses. Where she says that in Germany there was actually like a very strong fascination with extremely rich Jewish people, and they they held an exalted status. Uh, they were seen as being you know, of the highest order of people in a lot of cases, and were therefore given certain privileges that wasn't permitted to the majority of Jewish people. And this is obviously problematic, and so Jewish people were kind of given a choice. Either they could totally embrace the idea of, uh, of this new culture, and this is what would be called, or the term that Arendt uses to describe this, as a palvenu which is somebody who emerges from an obscure origin who has gained wealth or influence. So they have gained this kind of influence while still being marked for being different. Or Jewish people could say, you know what? No, I'm, I really am in love with my culture, my identity. I'm not going to shed that just to, you know, fit into this mold. And in which case they would still be discriminated against. They'd be viewed as subhuman. They would be viewed as, you know, any number of discriminatory, um, identity markers, and they would just assume the form of a pariah. Now, Arendt says that for Jewish people, largely, it was a choice either to be this figure of a, a palvenu, someone who was exalted, yet had a kind of different background than the uh, normal one that everyday people had, or to be a pariah. And that is someone who embraced their culture and really stuck with it at the expense of of being able to just mingle and be among others. And both cases is obviously, they're both problematic for Jewish people, but in any case, this is what uh, discrimination does. It forces people to adopt ways outside of their comfort zone to mold themselves to fit a world that hates them. Now, as an example, she uses uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who is a, a man born of Jewish origin, who was born into Christianity uh, with um, very few ties to his Jewish heritage. And he won, he had a very successful political career, he won political office, uh, he was a very influential figure, and he was very much this figure of the Palvenu, someone who was gained influence uh, even though they were from an outsider uh, identity category, an outsider group. He was able to gain all of this influence. And Disraeli very much sympathized with the experience of Jewish people. Now, good to put an asterisk here. In some ways, he was not. He didn't sympathize with them. But he very much recognized that although he renounced his Jewish identity and really embraced Christianity, he still held on to that to some extent. Now, Disraeli, for Arendt, very much stands in for this figure of the Palvenu. And uh, because he kind of gets rid of his culture and identity and everything, Yet he still very much embraced the idea of a kind of superiority by virtue of his having these Jewish roots. And other people bestowed that idea upon him as well, and associating, many people associating his success with his secret attachment to other Jewish people who were secretly powerful. And this began to, or really this jumped on the continuum of associating Jewish people with a race that could then begin to associate certain identity markers with them uh, innately. And even Disraeli believed very much in a Jewish conspiracy that was trying to take over British Parliament. He very much was victim to this, these ideas as well, and very much submitted to the idea that, you know, there is this thing called uh, the Jewish race that um, it, it kind of contains certain natural uh, identity markers. Now, this is neither to say that there's anything wrong with the idea of associating of certain people with a race, nor is there anything necessarily good about it. The point is that in this case, the idea of a race was employed to associate certain qualities with Jewish people uh, as though they were natural, which could then make it easier in the future, as we'd see with World War II, to uh, justify the extermination of Jewish people. Now, on its face, you know, at first glance, it would seem as though there was a historical justification to believe 
that Jewish people were um, forming these secret alliances that transcended political differences, that use political differences just to distract from their desire to gain global control. And one of the historical events or phenomena that can be used as evidence is that the uh, children of many rich Jewish people, very wealthy Jewish people, were socialists. They identified with socialism. So to the outside observer, it looked as though Jewish people were playing both sides. They were both wanting wealth that you know would only really be extracted through human labor that at the time was being exploited to insane degrees. And on the other hand, they were fighting for socialism. So it looked then from the outside that, oh, they were playing both sides. Now, the problem with this is that at the time, just because people were rich did not mean they had any actual affiliation with the way that money was being accumulated and wealth was being accumulated at the time through capitalist means of production, because many of these Jewish people were had the wealth from previously. So that explanation only assumes the form of a half-truth, and it really demands more context to explain why we saw that, why there would be uh, rich Jewish people who had children who were socialist, identify as being against the bourgeois. And that's because these rich Jewish people didn't actually belong to that class. They didn't belong to the capitalist class. They just happened to have wealth, which is an important note for anyone who's not totally familiar. And we get this out of Marx. There is a difference between wealth and uh, capital. Capital is what is extracted from human labor at a rate greater than is given back to that labor. So they are being exploited for their labor. You take out more than you put back in, or they are earning you more money than you're giving back. So it's an unfair exchange. Whereas wealth can just be accumulated from uh, history or it can uh, come about through more equitable means. Now, it's important to note that well, in a lot of the cases, just having wealth is itself probably a sign that, you know, either you or your, your family line has exploited other people, like no doubt about it. But there is a difference here. And at the time when people were pointing the finger at the bourgeois and capitalists and associating Jewish wealth with that, they were making uh, whatever it's called when you make a, a jump in logical reasoning, like an epistemic fallacy, they were making a connection that wasn't there. Now, the emerging idea of Jewish people as a race began to shape and reframe the ideas of criminality at the time in Europe. And she gives the example of France specifically that began to not persecute Jewish people quite as much because it was they were viewed as though any crime they may have committed was a result of their race. So they were kind of left off the hook for certain things. And obviously, while, of course, less punishment is something we should strive for as a culture, the reason for which that was occurring here was problematic. Yet, and, and the reason was that it began to associate certain attributes or acts of Jewish people with their race. Now, interestingly, uh, Arendt points to the ways in which gay people were also treated very similarly where their homosexuality was seen as being, you know, their entire identity, not a race, of course, but their orientation, that could then be used to explain why they're acting a certain way, which could then be used to say that they have these innate qualities that make them subhuman, make them worthy of uh, liquidation, essentially. And like uh, gay people, Jewish people were viewed then as just being naturally through their race, just being naturally traitors, being naturally um, clandestine, being naturally uh, plotting to take over the world. And when people are associated with certain identity markers, specifically identity markers that are held to be negative socially, what that does is it creates a situation in which these people can't be fixed because it's just part of their DNA, essentially. And that leaves the only solution, of course, to be extermination, which is, of course, where this eventually culminated into for Jewish people and for gay people. And that puts us here into chapter four, where we'll finally discuss the Dreyfus Affair. So 
In the late 19th century, in 1894, the French Jewish officer Alfred Dreyfus was accused and found guilty of being a German spy and was sentenced to exile uh, on Devil's Island in Northeast South America. Now, how they found out it was him was that they found a letter that was written by somebody in the German army or upper in German like intelligence uh, to someone in France, I believe, or vice versa, from France to someone in, in Germany. And they looked at this letter and they were like, oh, that looks like Albert's handwriting. Let's uh, send him away to this island. Of course, he was like one of the only Jewish officers. It was just it, like, of course, it wasn't a coincidence that they chose him. They weren't actually interested in finding out who it was. They were more interested in getting the one Jewish person out of there. Now, many things happened after he was sent to this island. There were many appeals to have his, you know, he would write letters back to France to have his uh, verdict appealed. People were, uh, handwriting experts had come in and said like, no, his handwriting is not the same as what we find on this letter. His family was working with, uh, certain other political figures to try to get him out, uh, to try to get him off this island. And many details about that that I don't have the time to go into now. But after about 10 years, he was acquitted, but unofficially. Like, he was only acquitted by a kind of review board of what had gone on, not by the actual like government agencies that would, uh, whose pardon would actually mean something or whose acquittal would actually mean something. So many people still thought that he was guilty, many everyday people, but there were splits. So like more left-leaning newspapers sided with him, saw him as being uh, wrongfully convicted, and then more conservative right-wing newspapers saw him as being guilty, and you know, we see we would see that play out. But this this situation, the Dreyfus affair is what it's called, uh, produced many effects. Obviously, it encouraged anti-Semitism but it also fostered doubt in the republic and democracy, which could also be chalked up to Jewish influence. Because either you have a Jewish person who was a spy for Germany, people could use that to make generalizations about Jewish people, or people could think, wow, what a mismanagement of justice here, what a miscarriage of justice, uh, Dreyfus was just uh, smeared by the state, and we all really know that the state is run by Jewish people, and so it was Jewish people that are behind this. It was uh, they were the ones that completely botched this. I have no faith anymore in the state. I have no faith in democracy or the republic because there are these secret actors working to undermine everything, and so that's not good. And in 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 which case, I, in either of those possible uh, views of it anti-Semitism still took the front seat. But to really grasp with the Dreyfus affair demands that we go back a few years, about a decade before it happened, to the Panama scandal. And the Panama scandal, there are a lot of moving parts to this, and I, again, I can't go into all the details about it, but essentially it goes like this. Where the Panama Company was responsible for crafting and putting together Su the Suez Canal, which is a very important trade route, uh, obviously, and you look at, you know, Google it, and I'm sure you've heard, if you haven't heard of it, you know, then you'll, you'll know immediately. Anyways, this company, the Panama Company, fell into bankruptcy at the expense of Parliament and the people. So I, I believe how it went was that the Panama Company kept trying to build this canal that would be good for industry, and so they had political support behind it. And they kept saying like, oh, we need more money, we need more money, we need more money to finish this. And they would never really finish it. It took them a long time. And so they presented a major drain on the economy and on uh, the, uh, on political life there, which meant that the people were pissed because all of their money was being sent to this thing that didn't yield them any returns, at least no immediate returns. So they were like, "What? where's my money? And it didn't help that some political figures were actually being bribed to encourage uh, other politicians to, you know, keep giving money to the Panama, uh, to the Panama Company. Now, at this time, there were some Jewish people who were a part of this. They they very much were part of the 
Panama Company and part of the political figures that um, made these decisions. And there were two really important ones. There was Jacques Renac and Cornelius uh, Heltz, where Renac, or I'll just, maybe I'll call him Jacques. It's a little bit more uh, recognizable. Jacques uh, was um, the, the superior to Hertz. So Jacques was Hertz's boss. And these were these were shady dudes. There's no doubt about it. They were accepting bribes. They, they weren't like great people. And Hertz used his knowledge, that is Hertz being uh, the subordinate to uh, Jacques, used his knowledge to blackmail Jacques, leading Jacques ultimately to commit suicide. Now, before falling prey to suicide, Jacques had actually written a bunch of letters containing the names of only Jewish people he, uh, he could place the blame on and have those sent to government and have those sent to pretty much all news outlets, actually. So suddenly everyone was associating this scandal with Jewish people and with Jewish people alone, which contributed to a great deal of public animosity against Jewish people and the view that they are secretly running things. But remember from last episode, Jewish people didn't have this kind of political power and financial clout that people believe them to have. And so the Jewish people could be scapegoated for these problems to what would appear to be from the outside and just at a quick glance appeared to be a healthy system. People saw the system, thought that it looked good, it was working smoothly. Suddenly there's this one scandal that a bunch of Jewish people are associated with and therefore that is taken as a sign of the harms that Jewish people are inflicting on an otherwise healthy system. And this seems like as good a time as any to go for a little ad break. Yeah, okay, I hope that wasn't too jarring, whatever that was. Let's continue on here with the Panama scandal. Now, the Panama scandal intensified a disintegration of unity among all people, including the general public and government officials, and it encouraged people to start to form cliques and groups and mobs that would be like a kind of reactionary group identity to oppose what was going on economically, politically, socially, that were, they were all being viewed as being um, essentially being diseased and needing to be remedied. So these kind of cliques and groups would cut across previously maybe uh, foreclosed connections. It, it would start to bring people together. So upper tier or <laughs> upper tier, upper class people were beginning to mingle with lower class people who suddenly had a common enemy in these secret Jewish conspirators that were screwing over the entire country, where you'd have politicians aligning with the clergy against Jewish people and so on. But interestingly, the military in all of this remained a kind of closed off group that wasn't mingling with other groups in any, in any way, unless they were going to do so to uh, realize their own interests, to improve their own situation. And they did jump into the fray, but only to condemn the Republic. And this is because, you know, the army was constructed in such a way as to be so rigid, to really uh, value tradition, to value structure and hierarchy, that at any point where it saw that there was corruption in the Republic, it saw itself as the last bastion of defense against these traditional values, because it saw that the Republic was crumbling. It saw that people were giving over to uh, licentiousness. They were giving themselves over to greed, to avarice. You know, greed is avarice, but they're giving themselves over to laziness and to greed in order to realize a few people's political dreams. So the army saw it as their duty to maintain the structure that was being threatened, largely by Jewish people. Uh, they believed that to be the case. Obviously, that wasn't the case. And so they kept themselves closed off, away from everything else. And similarly, we saw the church do the same thing. It began to condemn the Republic as being uh, spineless, you know, not actually embracing the rule of law, not actually conducting things the way they should be conducted, but instead giving itself over to international interest or to Jewish influence. And so the Catholic Church was like, no, us too. We are going to remain strong and traditional in the face of this. And so the hierarchical structures 
of the army and the church became a kind of um, seductive alternative to the chaos that was being presented in other social spheres and in government. And I just want to say that we are working back to the Dreyfus affair here. Like, we haven't forgotten, we haven't gone on a, it has been a tangent, but we're going to circle back to it in a minute. So the army and the church began to assume a kind of ultra-traditional role to oppose the chaos of the state. And they very much viewed Jewish people as being the problem to this. And so they said to themselves, no way, we are not going to let Jewish people screw this up for us. We're going to keep ourselves insular. We're not going to let Jewish people into these, our very traditional structure. We are just going to let everything else, all the chaos go on out there, and we're going to keep ourselves safe. And this might explain why the army was so quick to uh, condemn to uh, find Dreyfus guilty, because he fit that mold. He was a sign of that very problem that, you know, the Germans were cutting into the, uh, had found their way into the French army. That was a sign that chaos was starting to come in, a chaos that they had associated with the state. Now they said they saw that coming into themselves and they're like, oh, the chaos of the state was produced by Jewish people. So our problem must also be produced by Jewish people. And so they used that first opportunity, the first opportunity they could get to condemn the one Jewish officer to put him away because he was obviously the problem. Even though after he was exiled, the problem still persisted. The spying didn't stop. Now, in the face of all this, Arendt suggests that the Dreyfus family or Dreyfus's family didn't do themselves any favors when it came to actually addressing this. And it wasn't their fault because they didn't, no one could have really at the time saw what was going on. Everyone was too close to uh, the anti-Semitism. No one had the ability to take a step back and to see the big picture of what was going on here. But many of his family members actually um, used backdoor tactics like having someone forge documents uh, that they claimed were from Dreyfus rather than just appeal to the newly established idea of human rights. You know, they were also meeting in secret with other politicians and so on, which at the time they didn't know this, but these acts were going to be taken as signs of a broader, um, a, a kind of a natural proclivity on the part of Jewish people to work secretly, to realize and to, uh, to, to realize certain goals. So people saw the Dreyfus family doing this, and they were then seen, therefore, as contributing to this global Jewish conspiracy. Which, again, they had no idea that them just trying to get there, like in the case of his parents or, you know, the cousins, just trying to get Dreyfus free was going to be used to intensify the very anti-Semitism that put Dreyfus away. And it was with this, and I mentioned this earlier, that new groups began to emerge that cut across previous class divisions. So people from upper classes were associating with lower classes and other people in different groups were all beginning to commingle because they now had this common enemy. And this common enemy was largely the Jewish people. And like the mob in almost any setting, what happened was that they assumed a very anti-state, anti-parliamentary, anti-parliamentary, anyways, anti-parliamentary stance that very much aligned them with the army, with the church, with the police, other institutions that were growing wary of the state. Suddenly, there were all of these kinds of new alliances being drawn between these very strict conservative institutions and with mob rule and mob formations. And it's hard not to draw parallels here between what you know we're currently seeing going on uh or what we just saw go on in like in the united states with trump and with QAnon and with the january 6 riots what we saw with the freedom convoy in canada what we see are people coming together to oppose the state largely based off of conspiracy theories that aren't actually grounded in 
reality or misinformation being used to encourage people to come together, which on its face is a great thing to have people come together and to oppose something that they find unjust. But it is the kind of entire constellation of different ingredients here that are coming together in such a way as to foment anti-state hatred without a clear agenda that is going to potentially result in very negative things, which isn't to draw a parallel between anti-Semitism and a, you know, a few people sitting in hot tubs in, in Ottawa and blaring music. Like, Of course not. It's just about recognizing how there are various uh, connections to be drawn between mob mentality in different periods of time. And how we can, it's good to understand the logic of the mob in order to best uh, understand how to approach it and to make sure it doesn't devolve into, um, into what we saw with World War II or into totalitarianism, which might at the, this time right now, it might seem a little bit nebulous. You might be saying, how does, how does this get to totalitarianism? And I promise we're going to get there. Now, the mobs that were forming at this time were different from mobs of the past. Uh, and that is because at this time, mobs very much aligned with those institutions that were against the state. So they were actually really um, joining the state while criticizing and challenging the state only certain elements of the state, like in the, like in the United States where you, you know, there's a belief in the deep state, uh, and which motivates a lot of anti-Congress, a lot of anti-Senate, uh, you know, anti, uh, anti-government sentiments, but these people love the military or they love the church or they love the police, which are, at least in the case of the police and the military, are government institutions, but they serve other functions. That is, they are, uh, they essentially stand in for their values. So then they're okay. You know, these people are able to put aside their differences with the state if it's working directly for their uh, benefit. Anyways, at this time, with these associations between the state, some forms of the state or some institutions of the state and the mob, now there could be certain figures that could emerge to stand in for the mob's anger, who could be the voice of the mob's anger, who themselves assumed an anti-parliamentary role. And some of these figures that we would see emerge would be, uh, in the case of Russia, we would see Stalin. In, in uh, Nazi Germany, we would see Hitler. In Italy, we'd see Mussolini, Mussolini, excuse me, people who would stand in and be a voice for people who believe themselves to be voiceless in the face of these secret organizations that were secretly running things. And, you know, in the case of the Dreyfus affair, even people who weren't anti-Semitic, even people who believed Dreyfus, who wanted to fight on behalf of Dreyfus, very much lost faith in the state. And so they themselves had to take extra parliamentary action. They had to take action that didn't go through standard channels in order to actually remedy the situation because they didn't believe that the state was actually representing their values. So there were mobs on both sides, you know, a mob in support of anti-Semitism and then mobs. Insofar as mobs are anti-state, you had mobs that weren't anti-Semitic that were trying to oppose that situation. Now, the church was actually very clever in that they saw this and were like, oh, we can use this division among people on the basis of anti-Semitism, we can use this basis to further exacerbate the belief that Jewish people are uh, secretly running things. So they would say, Jewish people want to divide us and look at us, we are divided. And so the people hear that and say, oh, maybe then there is something behind that idea that Jewish people are secretly running things because I find myself not connected to my neighbor or you know, other people in my class. I find myself connected instead to this, this guy in this other uh, group altogether who just has the same affinity with me on the basis of being anti-state. So you're losing old connections and making new ones, which you know creates a sense of anxiety in people, which makes them ripe for explanations as to why they're feeling that way. And so when the church comes in and says, oh, it's Jewish people that have divided us, 
then suddenly there's a very easy face to use to understand that situation, to understand why you feel that way. And this revealed the extent to which no matter how integrated and assimilated the people became, that is Jewish people became in society, they were always going to be viewed as pariahs. They were always going to be discriminated against. And so it makes total sense that in response to this, there would be calls for the formation of a Jewish state. Just because there are so many uh, efforts to try to disenfranchise the Jewish people or to place the blame onto the Jewish people for everything wrong with society, it makes total sense that they're like, you know what, screw this. Like, I want to get out of here, um, you know, be among the people who I have the strongest affiliation with so that, you know, you can live peacefully, develop, um, recognize connections with these other nations, you know, through the standard channels of, you know, through the state, through international trade in legitimate ways or in open ways. So there wouldn't be any of this rhetoric about, you know, secret Jewish world conspiracy or anything like that. And of course, uh, it didn't necessarily work, you know, following the formation of the state of Israel, anti-Semitism still very much holds sway, still very strong, obviously up till today. Now we'll, we're going to get into this more in the next episodes, but at the same time, it's also important to recognize that in the case of the formation of the state of Israel, there was another kind of oppression that was kind of mounted at, uh, in that moment, especially against Palestinian people and against the neighboring Arabic countries that points to um, kind of extension or a replication, repetition of similar kinds of oppression, which is important to note because with any kind of social movement, nobody should want to repeat the same harms, but now to inflict them against a new group of people. So it's just important in my mind to keep that in the back burner. And that's where we'll wrap up part one of the book. So the end of my part two, but the end of part one. So that'll close up anti-Semitism. And next time we're going to pick up on to part two titled Imperialism, where she's going to talk about how the logics of expansion began to work to dissolve the idea of the nation state that was already under assault. So suddenly countries were starting to expand beyond themselves and were losing attachments to their land, to their state structures, and people were losing even more faith in the state than they had, had already lost. And yeah, if uh, you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. Um, and yeah, on that note, take care.